Mount Antelope Park Church online worship. The call to worship. We are here in the name of Jesus Christ. We were once strangers to each other and strangers to God, kept apart by our rules and fears, suspicions of anyone who didn't look like us. We were once short on hope and mean with our love, but Christ broke down the walls between us. He made us new in people, in one spirit, children of God and citizens of his kingdom. We belong in Christ forever at home in God. His own flesh, Jesus broke down the hostility between us. The dividing wall came crumbling down. Christ is our peace. We are one in Christ. Let everyone praise the Lord. The Lord's name be praised. question I have for you is what do you do for the church? What do I do for the church? Well, <laughs> I have uh, used, I've participated in the choir. Um, it's been a little different since um, me and Holly got separated, but um, I helped get my dad to church and um, I just kind of be available when people need help. I'm kind of limited in my time with my work. But I just like to be available when people call. Um, I really appreciate the people that come and visit my dad, help take care of him. And um, um, I like to uh, help in the community garden. I like helping when John Duran has an idea, I kind of like helping him get those things going. And um, I like to be a worship leader. I like to be involved with choir. And Someday when my schedule gets a little less crazy, I'd like to involve in one of the commissions in the church being or like um, the um, some part of uh, the um, um, 
a worship committee or some part maybe part of the um, helping with the youth in the um, in Sunday school. So those kind of things I like to be involved with. Okay, second question. How can we be intentional on inviting and getting to know others of different ethnic backgrounds? Um, I just think, I think we do a pretty good job of that. I just think that we really need to be intentional about inviting people that we know to church. And I'm not really good at that myself, but I think the more we can ask people and just when people are talking about things, just talk about our church. And when you say, well, what do you like to do? Say that, well, going to part of being, um, being um, a member of my church is an important part of what I do. And it's kind of, a, it's a social thing, but it's also something that gets me through the hard times. So I think it's important to talk about that stuff just when we're in conversations about, so people just know what you're about. So don't be shy about saying that you go to church because I think some, some people think that going to church, especially in this culture is such a bad thing and just make sure that there's all kinds of different kinds of church and that um, to be open at least to listening to what somebody says about it. All right, so what can we do to make sure people feel welcome? I just think making sure that we are, um, people know that we're not a judgmental church, but that we're open to having anyone come. Like Jesus said that he was, he's for everyone. He's not just for one people, or you don't have to believe a certain thing. And just give a chance to people, give people a chance when they do come to our church to get comfortable being there and just, um, just be having lots of things, offering lots of things, being offering things for children, offering things for older people, offering things for um, so young adults. So, and I think people with children, especially, um, I know we don't have a lot of children in our church, but making um, things available to them and have and something that would be interesting for them. So do you think it is important for the church to speak up about the rise of white supremacy? Um, I do think it's important because um, what people believe is so extreme right now. They're so, they're so, they're willing to act on what they believe and they're willing to do it at any means. Like there's no common ground. And I think it's important to talk that we can at least talk to each other about how we feel and whether we feel strongly about one way or the other, that talking about it and, and is the best way to do things rather than be violent about what we do. So I think it is important to talk about. Okay. All right. So thank you guys for uh, listening and I'll see you next Sunday. Thanks, Olivia. Mm -hmm. Let's pray. Christ, you are present in our hearts. You are present in our midst. We thank you for the people of this church today. We are small and yet mighty due to your power and grace. The parishioners of this church, Lord, are so faithful, not just in sharing your grace, but also with their gifts and offerings. We offer the gifts presented to you today, Jesus. Allow us to envision your will for this body in this time and place, and let us use your resources for the good of the body, for the community and the world. Give us eyes to see those around us that we can witness to, how you are alive and available to all those who open their hearts, and that you love them. We love, Lord, because you first loved us. 
On this Valentine's Day, we thank you for love we have found in others, with others. Be with those that are lonely today, Jesus. Help us to feel your presence. Be with those in need of social interaction and have us find new ways to connect with each other and use languages of healing to offer all those around us some healing. Protect us, find ways to stay safe and guide us, we ask. We ask for healing for myself and others in our midst, for those that are still grieving. As we look forward to this season of Lent, we humble ourselves to your power and glory, Jesus. You are holy, Lord. You are worthy. We bow down and offer our hearts. Come in and find a space there. We offer them to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Remember that you were at one time without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel, strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope without God in the world. 
But now Christ in Jesus, now in Christ Jesus, you are once far off, but have been brought near to the blood of Christ. For he is our peace. In his flesh, he has made it us both groups one and has broken down the dividing walls, that is, the hostility between us. He has abolished the law with its commandments and ordinances that he might create in himself one new humanity in place of two, thus making peace, and might reconcile both groups to God in one body through the cross, thus putting to death the hostility through it. So he came and proclaimed peace to you who are far off and peace to those who are near. And through both of us, access to one spirit in the Father. So you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are citizens and saints, also members of the household of God, built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets with Jesus Christ himself as the cornerstone. In him, the whole structure is joined together and grows into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you are also built together spiritually in the dwelling place of God. Revelation 7. After this I looked, and there was a great multitude that no one could count, from every nation, from all the tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne, and everyone before the Lamb. Robed in white, palm branches in their hands, they cried out in a loud voice, saying, Salvation belongs to God who is seated on the throne and to the Lamb. May God add blessing and understanding to the reading of his word. Our message today is God loves diversity. In my continued reading for this sermon series, I again came across something from Rabbi Sachs, who we looked at some of his work with God's character trait of justice a few weeks ago. This was an article in the National Catholic Reporter discussing an interview he had for Interfaith Voices regarding, regarding how God loves diversity. He was applying this to how God loves people of various faith traditions, but the author of this article, Maureen Fiedler, says his words could be applied to people of all ages, ethnicities, sexual orientations, or any other characteristic. God loves diversity in life on earth, in rivers and seas, in clouds, soil, snow, trees, grasses, landforms, and animals of all kinds, she said. This got me thinking how we know that without diversity of genes, species tend to not survive here on earth. Fiedler says the message for us is deep and that we are called to love as God loves and to honor and preserve diversity. Yet we tend to act as though differences are something to be feared and that this is the origin of racism, sexism, prejudice, xenophobia, etc. We hear prejudicial remarks about people based on whether they, where they come from, due to their religion, or even sometimes on their skin color. These attitudes turned a blind eye and a deaf ear to the diversity God created and loves. And so in doing, they are turning a blind eye to God as we are called to love as he loves. This is Black History Month, as you probably know. And as we continue in our journey and looking at racial justice, I thought it would be important for us to really look at and remember God's vision includes all people and that Jesus came to break down barriers. We will look at this in regards to using language that heals rather than divides, how the church has failed historically at working to be multi-ethnic, while we touch also on white supremacy in our world today. Last week, I was, I was recovering from my surgery. I offered you an opportunity to worship digitally with the Quinn Mighty Chapel, an AME church here in Lincoln. I watched, watched one part of the revival services held midweek, 
and also their Sunday worship. I have watched a few of their other worships on their Facebook page in the last few weeks, as I mentioned, and I enjoy Pastor Brandy's messages and learn some things while enjoying how they do their Zoom worship. Now, I know it may have felt too awkward for some to show up in a predominantly African-American church, and that's okay. I myself enjoy worshiping in different settings, but I understand it's if some chose to worship elsewhere or not at all last week. One reason I thought it was a good choice was not just due to them being African-American and we're trying to learn, but that they are open and affirming as we are. Anyhow, I had forgotten what I had learned about the AME church and as God always does, their history seems to fit right in with what we're learning. And so if you don't know, AME stands for African Methodist Episcopal Church. It was the first a denomination in the U.S. for African Americans and was formed by Reverend Richard Allen and others in the early 1800s in Philadelphia. The reason they split from the Methodist Episcopal Church was due to them being segregated and not allowed to fully participate in the white-led Wesleyan churches. Then a few were accepted as preachers, but only for Black congregations. So they formed their own denomination. And others that encouraged racism in their churches quickly joined them. I can't help but wonder, what if this had not occurred? This was the first split for social reasons per articles and not based on theological reasons. But I think it is theologically based. As it seems to me, not allowing certain individuals to have full participation in the life of the church is denying the God image in each individual and definitely a theological issue. And if this had not occurred, would we have more multi-ethnic communities of worship today? Did we derail God's plan as usual? This was two and a quarter centuries ago. What have we missed out on due to this split and other splits of churches to become more ethnically homogeneous in both black and white churches? And I wonder how it can become more possible for more churches to be multi-ethnic as well. We also need to reframe how we think about white supremacy as the problems of white people, not one that we just need to empathize with on behalf of people of color. If you didn't see it on my Facebook page this week, I posted this meme that I found. White supremacy will not die until white people see it as a white issue they need to solve rather than a black issue they need to empathize with. That's powerful, isn't it? I must say this is a bit, bit of a different twist than I had ever looked at it. And it goes along with the fact that we have a racial reckoning to deal with, not just in this country, but in the church worldwide. I want to share a portion of a video from Jamar Tisby regarding the book I've been reading and we're dealing with in this series titled The Color of Compromise. It deals with the scriptures that Eric read for us today. But I wouldn't mind if we all experienced a bit of godly grief. In 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 10, Paul writes to the Corinthians and he says, For godly grief produces a repentance that leads to salvation without regret. So the idea of godly grief here is that there are things in our past to grieve over, to weep over, to lament about when it comes to racism and the American church. It's, it's the idea that, that as a, a people who follow Jesus Christ, we haven't done enough. We haven't done what we should have when it comes to fighting racism, and that should produce in us grief, but a certain type of grief a grief that leads to change, a grief that leads to confession and repentance so that the future might look different, might look better than the past. Now, this entire series is looking forward, and it's based on God's vision for the church. I love Revelation 7-9. 
It says, After this I looked, and there before me was a great multitude that no one could count, from every nation, tribe, people, and language, standing before the throne and before the Lamb. In that heavenly congregation, we finally see the culmination of God's gathering a diverse people who are unified by their faith in Christ. But this is not just a distant reality. It's not something that we can only hope for in heaven. Jesus commands us to pray, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And that command certainly would include a gathering of people from all nations and tribes as best we can right here and right now and to work toward that. In Ephesians chapter 2, it talks about Jesus Christ breaking down the dividing wall of hostility between the followers of Jesus Christ. And that's a reality that we must live into even now, even today. Peace between racial and ethnic groups is not something we have to achieve. It has to be received by faith and lived out. But historically, we haven't lived out these truths. Not enough, and I don't think with enough urgency. The reality is the church needs the carpenter from Nazareth to deconstruct the house that racism built and remake it into a house for all nations. My hope for this video series is that you would move from being actively racist or even passively racist to being actively anti-racist. What we need is a generation of Christians who will intentionally and in a sustained way consciously fight against the racism that still pervades our society. And so these lessons are a call to abandon complicit Christianity and move toward a courageous Christianity. God breaks down the dividing wall of hostility between us. Now it seems Paul is not talking about race, but of those once far from God who were brought near. He's referring to the inclusion of the Gentiles into the body of Christ. And I know this is not the same thing as a division between blacks or whites or Republicans or Democrats, but the point can pertain because Christ breaks down all barriers. We can even apply this to think of those who have racist tendencies and those who try to be anti-racist. Eric touched on this, I think, in his chat with Olivia. He said, sometimes people need to try to find common ground, even if people disagree on things and feel strongly about their beliefs. We need to be able to talk to each other in other words, to find the common humanity, the good in all. I truly agree with this. We'll come back to that in a bit. And then there was Revelation 7, with a great multitude praising God together. We know this is God's plan, and that while it will not be perfected until Christ's return, we are still called to work towards that, as Jamar stated. And so we come back to this notion, God loves diversity, and Christ breaks down barriers. We often talk about it, it used to be on our website, how the church is meant to build bridges. But this is not what we see today. So we are called to speak out about it. As Eric said, it's important that we talk about it. This brings me to what that question asked about the rise of white supremacy we see in the world. This is not just an issue seen here in this country for injustice as we know is global. But I saw another video this week that gave me chills and has to do with the reason I believe God has called me to go on this journey regarding racism with you. It was a black Baptist preacher discussing how white preachers are cowards by not discussing racism at this time. This also relates to the message we heard a few weeks ago about, about speaking truth and love to power courageously, that the spirit of truth will guide us. This pastor in the video was calling out white pastors 
for not talking about the rise in white supremacy in this country right now. And I felt convicted about it, I must say, because I've not really talked about the insurrection much even. Part of the reason has to do with this partisan political culture we are surrounded in. Part of it is my fear of being labeled, being anti-government, anti-Christian even. And part of it has to do with my own uncomfortableness of dealing with this. But I will face my white fragility, challenge my own biases, assumptions, and make myself grow spiritually and call this out. What we saw at the Capitol on January 6th, some of it has racist underpinnings. We saw extremist groups like the Proud Boys, the Oath Keepers. One man had a 6MWE logo on his shirt, which means 6 million wasn't enough, having to do with the Holocaust. There was a Confederate flag walked through the Capitol building halls. In fact, the presence of hate groups and crimes has been on the rise for almost a decade. They have felt more and more comfortable being out in the open instead of in hiding. And we have to deal with this. Often as a deflection remark I hear when calling out actions we see today is what about the riots this summer? What about BLM? Well, I find it ridiculous to make such a comparison. And it's part of the reason we as a church are not dealing with this. But this has been a tactic used throughout time, calling these ideas Marxist or socialist. I said this once before and I will say it again. When did racism become partisan politics? It shouldn't be. We are a country who claims liberty and justice for all and we follow a God who demands it. I do condemn the riots that occurred this summer, and I believe they deeply hurt the cause of racial justice. But really, these two things have nothing to do with each other. First, 95% of the protests last year were peaceful, and the reason for them stemmed from centuries of oppression. And they were a direct result of police brutality and policing that violates the dignity and respect of Black Americans. Even at one of these protests, we saw another starking disparity of justice. When Kyle Rittenhouse shot three people and walked right by the police with his hands up. And others where police used tear gas on citizens that were peacefully protesting or were detained and put in military vans of some sort. Compare that with the response at the Capitol where the protesters were white. Well, before they became violent and then were rioters. To me, these events are white privilege and racism out in the open for us to see. And we in the church need to be condemning it and speaking about the evils of white supremacy. We saw a documentary this week called Homegrown Hate. I don't know if you've seen it, but it was quite alarming. The church is losing its social power, yes. Why? Because we dare not talk about these things. Well, I say we must. How and when is an issue we will delve into in a few minutes. I also attended the Church of the Brethren's Intercultural Ministries webinar that you may have saw in today's news or on Facebook. Or maybe you even attended this week with Drew Hart, the author of Who Will Be a Witness that we're using. And while we're still are not getting too much into this work yet, much of it's, his thoughts in the book have been or will be in this series. He mentioned in this webinar that some people say to him when he goes to speaking engagements, can't we just get over this? Or, I don't see racism. So he asks questions about their life experience and history with racial justice to see if they, in fact, everyone in their family has been working for it all their lives. But he says that's very rare. He discussed what we talked about in my last sermon that we can't just treat Jesus like our crazy uncle 
that discipleship requires us to make Jesus's radical life and teachings visible to those around us. We have to take him seriously, that he did break down walls and calls us to seek justice. Hart said that there have been high levels of complicity through silence and at times even active participation in racist systems and ideologies in the church. He said, unfortunately, white Christians are more apt to express racist thoughts than other non-Christian whites. I found this sad and disturbing. We discussed this a little when we talked about some of the evangelical pastors being part of the rise of theologies dealing with supremacy last month. There's that political divide again, though. It seems it's there so that we don't talk about these things. And we talked about this a little when we discussed loving our enemies, letting love lead in the midst of partisanship. But I feel we must talk about this again right here due to the nature of this message. So I have another resource to share with you regarding this, another book. This one is titled, A Language of Healing for a Polarized Nation. I haven't read the book, but a pastor friend of mine put something on Facebook about a church that had some Zoom webinars based on the book. It was like a three-week class on the book featuring the three authors, Wayne Jacobson, Arnita Taylor, and Bob Prater. This three-part series was fascinating. And I'll probably order the book, especially for the practical steps and questions they highlighted a little of within these sessions. Now, Jacobson is a theological writer, and he had some great insights to me regarding the work of healing needed in the world today. The work of peacemaking, they even called it. This can be relevant to much of the work needed on God's behalf in the world today, I think, too, especially environmental justice. So he said we need to work with others that are not in our private spheres. We need to learn to step out and see what others are doing and join in. And he said binary thinking is the fuel of our polarized society and is partly due to our two-party system. I really agree with this. He also said that he now is not just bipartisan politically but considers himself anti-partisan. This disrupts our ability to think of things deeply when we think there's just two answers, two parties, two of everything. That's that binary thinking. We just think there's two positions. He discussed how this is relevant to back the blue in Black Lives Matter. Like you can't care about cops and care about Black youth. He tries to not just see an A and B option, but sees those that are offered to us as the A and Z option. And it's up to all the stakeholders to find a solution from the middle of them. And he said the media and social media has created part of this binary thinking. So he offers us some suggestions to find a rational person that thinks differently and get in a conversation not to convince them, but to learn. So when we hear people's stories, their experiences that have informed them differently, we then find common ground. Now you can see we're back to what Eric mentioned. And he called this sacred peacemaking work. And he said our private spaces like our churches are good, but we also need to think about our shared space in the world of economics and governance, for example, and to think about practices that allow for healing. Feeling comfortable in our skin is the first one the authors mention. They said if we don't feel comfortable in our beliefs, we tend to hunker down on our point of view and see everyone who disagrees with is, as wrong or even an enemy. Then we marginalize every other view. Our response to issues is controlled. We don't allow for curiosity on where beliefs come from. 
he said to look at the news, like 70% of it is truth and 30% is their slant towards some bias. And that we should look at many different types of news sources. He said, look for the best things that people say in order to meet them. Embrace something and find that common ground. Another author is John P Robert Prater. Another author is Robert Prater. He was a self-proclaimed supremacist and was very judgmental until he had a dream that he was a judge and his daughter was brought in for him to condemn. He then recused himself, took off his robe and instead became her advocate. He says this was a major wake up call to him and now he is drawn to people that believe differently to him. He had some great experiences to share of how he tends to seek out others that don't think like him and befriend them. And they discussed how sitting at a table is an important way to have these important conversations. There's just something about breaking bread together. Let's be a God thing, right? And we know that to be true. I saw a video of this young black man in a very racist town inviting others with signs to come and have lunch in the middle of a park. And he wanted to sit down and have tough conversations with them sitting down to eat as it was a great way to really learn about each other. God bless his work. And the last author of this book is Arnita. She's a black development leader and a black Christian who works with and lives in a predominantly white setting. She had some great insights about sitting at the table too and how we need to be intentional if we feel called to having relationships and having important conversations of healing <clears throat> and even racism with other people, even between races. She said she often sees a minority group set up their own table. This is reminded me of how the black church formed and how this might relate to others that come into churches that might feel different than those there. She said inclusion is tough work, but it's God-given work. Now this book is a compilation of many discussions they had using languages of healing in a polarized setting. Of course, I can't get into all of it, but if you'd like to watch this great series, you can find it at ChristChurchCranbook.org, or you could buy or read the book. But I do want to mention the five practices the book is centered around dealing with this language of healing for a polarized world. I mentioned the first already, feeling comfortable in your own skin. The second is to cultivate compassion. The third is listen up. The fourth is to go from my good to our good. And the last is to be willing to be disruptive. We'll get into that last one in another sermon a little more. And as we wrap up this sermon, let us remember that we are called to heal with words as Jesus did. And he taught us to build bridges and that Christ came to break down barriers as stated in the text. We need to remember we are undeserving of the opportunity God provided through the blood of Christ to be brought near the divine, to the presence of God. We praise you for the blood of Christ, God, and for the Holy Spirit's leading as we find ways to be the church together and to fight injustice for your glory. Amen.
Our benediction comes from a song, God of Wonders. God of Wonders beyond our galaxy, you are holy, you are holy. Precious Lord, reveal your heart to me. You are holy, you are holy. Go now with God revealed in your hearts and spread the healing of Christ to those in your midst.